Hi, I'm Adam with FCP Euro. Today we're going to take an in-depth look into the Volvo P3 chassis suspension and brakes. Models include the S60, the S80, the V60, the V70, the XC70, and the XC60. And the XC60 kind of stands apart from those other models because in form and function, they are the same. Those parts aren't actually interchangeable like those other models. There was also an S60 and a V60 Polestar edition. Those brakes and suspension packages are so drastically different that I'm not actually gonna cover those in this video. Today, I'm gonna do a quick suspension and brake overview. I'm going to start with the design and function and then we're going to put this car up on the lift and uh, take a more in-depth tour uh, on the car. This V60 has 150,000 miles on it but it is only six years old so it's going to be very interesting to see how all of the rubber components have fared over that time. Generally when you talk about bushings and suspension components uh, as a whole Age is more important than mileage, so I'm very interested to see what we're gonna find when we're under there. So, starting with the front suspension, you'll notice that it's a basic McPherson strut setup. It's actually very similar to the P1 chassis instead of the P2, because it has a strut insert design that uses a pinch bolt to fasten it to the steering knuckle. Moving to the back, what you're gonna find is a Again, pretty standard multi-link independent rear suspension with a trailing arm. Depending on if you have all-wheel drive or front-wheel drive, you're not going to actually see that much of a difference between uh, those two cars because the actual parts are more or less the same. Obviously, you're going to see axles and drivetrain components, but other than that, everything is very similar. Even the body pan is the same. Moving on to brakes. So you would think that Volvo would directly tie brake size to package and trim level, but it's not that easy. So a little bit later on, I'm gonna show you how you can tell which brake sizes you have on your car. But for now, I'm just gonna let you know that there are three sizes, 300 millimeter, 316 millimeter, and 336. For the rear brakes, for most P3 chassis cars, you're gonna have a solid rear rotor. You're also gonna have uh, the option of a ventilated rear rotor. Luckily, you can just kind of look at those and uh, see which one is on your car. So for the XC60, it's a little bit easier because the front brakes are the same across the entire model range. Uh, you're gonna get a standard two piston front brake caliper and on the back, you're gonna get a, a ventilated rotor. And when I said it's very easy, now in 2016, of course, they change it up a little bit. You could also have a single piston. Luckily, it's easy to tell the difference just by looking at it. Okay, now that we have the brief overview out of the way, now I can put the car up in the air and we can take a closer look and see how these components work together, see how they could potentially fail, and get a kind of an idea of how we can diagnose some of the problems with the suspension and brakes on these cars. All right, now that we're at the car, I could show you a couple of things that are really important for you to know if you're gonna start working on these. The first is that this is the 300 millimeter brake setup. If you're gonna be shopping for brakes, like I said before, you have to know your brake size. This is a bespoke caliper. So basically, the 300 millimeter brake caliper will only fit 300 millimeter brakes. See how the spring is set up? You can basically go look on your own car and get an idea of which brake setup you have. If your brake caliper looks like this, you can see an obvious difference in uh, the spring here. This would be either a 336 millimeter or a 316 millimeter uh, brake caliper. Uh, the easiest way to know what the difference between those two are is to take a look at the casting on the bracket. So this one says 336 on there, the other one will say 316. So if you don't wanna go through the trouble of taking your wheel off and checking what size is on the casting, you could just send us your VIN and we'll be able to tell you what size brakes you have. So just like any other brakes, there are kind of three main reasons why you would wanna change them. The first would be a pulsating pedal that's usually caused by years and years and years of buildup uh, unevenly of the friction material onto the rotor. You would also wanna replace it if there are grooves or cuts in it. You'll be able to see either if the brake pad is kind of etching into it unevenly or if it's been sitting and has gotten rusty and then you have a lot of debris basically inhibiting your friction. And the third reason would be is if the brake pad material is actually really thin, like say between three and five millimeters. If you have really thin brake pads, it can't dissipate heat as well. And what you'll end up uh, getting is a lot of loss of friction, especially in like, say, fast traffic, and that can result in a dangerous situation. So if you have like three or five millimeters of brake pad material, you definitely wanna change those, uh, which is actually the situation that I have uh, right now. Finally, about every 
two or so years or about 30,000 miles, you're going to want to replace the brake fluid inside the, the brake system. So just normal flush, it's very easy to do. If you let your brake fluid sit in there for too long, it can uh, absorb water, which both lessens the effectiveness of your brakes, and it also can cause uh, corrosion of uh, the internal components, which will end up re resulting in brake failure. If you ever bought a very old used car and realized that it needed all new brake lines, that's the reason. So as you can see, I have a solid rear setup on this. If you had a vented rear, you would be able to see the, um, the venting in the, in the top. As you can also see, there's a uh, electronic parking brake unit. The only Volvo P3 that had a mechanical parking brake was a 2007 S80. After that, they all went to this electronic uh, parking brake unit. There's a couple ways to back that parking brake off when you're doing a brake job. I'm going to cover that a little bit later. For now, that's all you really need to know about the, um, the rear brakes on a P3 chassis Volvo. So starting with the front struts, you can see that it's an insert style with a pinch bolt that goes into the steering knuckle. A couple of things that you really want to keep an eye out for when dealing with front struts is one, if your front end is bouncing uh, over bumps, you can kind of detect a bounce if you push down on it, usually with the hood up because it's easier to push down on the fender so you don't push your hood in. If it bounces up and then down and then back up again, you're definitely going to want to take a closer look at your struts. And what you're going to be looking for would be leaks specifically really rusty parts that might indicate that the strut is just super old. Another way to kind of get an idea of if your, if your front struts are good or bad is if they're getting hung up or if it feels like it's kind of crashing over bumps, that'd be a good time to take a look at your struts and maybe think about uh, replacing them because you should have a nice damped spring motion. If it's not nice and damped, you're gonna get a lot of vibration coming through into the cabin. You should probably look at replacing your struts. The P3 chassis also came with a 4C electronic setup. To tell if you have that 4C electronic active suspension, one, you can look on your center dashboard, you'll see a active suspension panel in there. The other would be to take a look at the actual uh, strut itself and you'll see an electronic portion of it with a plug going into it. Uh, those are different and not interchangeable. So if you have a 4C electronic suspension system, you have to replace that with 4C electronic struts. One of the weak spots of the P3 chassis front suspension is going to be the uh, strut mount and strut bearing. Uh, generally, these only really last around 60 to 80,000 miles. Sometimes you can get lucky depending on your environment or how many miles you have. But if you're finding that the front end has got a little bit like of a scraping noise to it or when you turn the wheel, or you have a bump over low uh, and medium speed corners. It could possibly be the inside of the strut mount breaking through and flopping around in there, or the bearing itself that uh, situates this in here that is going bad. And sometimes the bearings separate and uh, can cause uh, all sorts of front end problems. So as you can see, this control arm features an integrated ball joint that goes up into the spindle. The reason why you would want to replace a control arm is usually because either the ball joint is bad or the main bushings are bad. Fortunately, these are available as a complete unit. So if you have a bad ball joint or your control arm bushings are bad, then you can just replace the whole thing as a unit. Bad ball joints, you can usually tell by looking at them if the boot is torn. It usually means they've gone dry. And if there's no grease in there, then it'll start to wear and separate pretty quickly. So you could check for play by using a crowbar or a pry bar and just kind of leverage against the control arm of the ball joint. Obviously this looks uh, completely tight, so that's in good shape. So to check the main bushing, you can kind of get a little bit of leverage here. Again, you can see a little bit of compliance, which is normal. That's what basically insulates the uh, noise vibration and harshness from the road. When the bushings go bad, you'll notice a lot more deflection here. This will allow this whole control arm to move back and forth. That will uh, translate as a vagueness in steering and more vibration being transferred into the cabin. So this is the third and final contact to the chassis. Uh, there's a bushing in there too. And you can check for deflection there. This one, again, looks pretty normal, pretty good. If the bushings aren't torn and there's not a whole lot of deflection, then most likely your control arms are good. If you do have a decent amount of deflection or you find any tears, that's a good time to replace your control arms. The average lifespan of control arm really depends on a multitude of different factors. And that's gonna be your environment, age, and your driving habits. If you are really easy in your car, you live in a place that does not have a lot of road salt, or your car is fairly new, even if it's got a lot of miles on it like this one, generally the bushings will be okay. If you have a 2007 or a 2008, 
then you might start finding that your bushings are going to start going bad, they're going to start tearing, they're going to be shrinking inside the housing, so be on the lookout for having a control arm replacement in your near future. If you've got a front end clunk over uneven surfaces or not necessarily rough roads but undulating roads, the most common cause of that is a sway bar end link. And this sway bar end link on P3 chassis cars on the front has two ball joints if they get a little bit loose. Basically every time the front wheel on one side is higher or lower than the other side, that gives that an opportunity to have a little bit of play in it. And that will manifest itself into a clunk that will transmit into the cabin. They're really easy to replace and they're very inexpensive. So if you're chasing a clunk around on the front end, even if you don't necessarily feel it when you're you know, tugging on it or crying on it, it still is a good idea to go ahead and just replace those. So speaking of the next thing, the final ball joint that's gonna be involved in your front suspension is gonna be the tie rod. This is responsible for connecting your steering rack to either your, uh, your knuckle. If you have vagueness in your steering and you are finding that maybe the car is influenced by throttle if you're braking or if you're applying throttle and the car is kind of steering in different directions during that, definitely check out your tie rod end because if this ball joint is loose, when you apply throttle and weight comes off of it, it will cause it to move one way and if you hit the brakes, and it compresses and it's got play in it, it will sometimes allow it to move in the other direction. That is a very dangerous situation. Definitely check your tie rod ends if you do feel something like that immediately. So the final and one of the most important things to talk about when dealing with front end suspension issues on P3 chassis cars is to talk about the subframe bushings. Now your subframe is what mounts all of your suspension and a lot of your drivetrain components onto. So if the main mounts to the chassis are bad, uh, you're gonna experience a lot of uh, vagueness in the front, it's gonna wander. And when you're giving it throttle or hitting the brakes, you're gonna feel clunks and it's generally gonna perform very poorly. So a good way to test if your subframe bushings are bad is to just pry up against the chassis and against the subframe mount. And uh, you can see this one this bushing is feeling pretty good, feeling pretty tight. Generally, you should probably be able to get around uh, 200,000 miles out of these. Again, depending on your environment, if you are in a place with a lot of salt, a lot of changes in weather between hot and cold throughout the seasons, then your rubber parts like your subframe bushings are gonna last a lot less. So real quick, I wanna mention the front wheel bearing. Uh, it's very similar to the uh, P1 style where instead of having a hub that you can just kind of replace, uh, it is a giant press-in bearing. So if you do find out you need a wheel bearing, I would recommend just taking the entire assembly off and just dropping it off at the shop and having them press the new bearing in. Uh, when your wheel bearing goes bad, you'll hear it kind of like a grinding noise. You'll feel a dragging. Even sometimes the hub or the wheel will be kind of hot to the touch because the bearing is no longer uh, adequately doing its job. The best way to tell if your wheel bearing is bad is to just grab the wheel and move it up and down, sort of in this fashion. Uh, if you have any sort of play in there at all, then you most likely have a bad wheel bearing and it's allowing play in the hub. A lot of people misdiagnose a bad wheel bearing as a bad tie rod end because that will allow play this way. So generally the best way to find a bad wheel bearing is to move it uh, back and forth like that. That's pretty much all there is to know about the front suspension on the P3 chassis. If you're used to working on Volvos, you'll actually find that this is easier to work on than say like a P2 because you need less special tools, especially uh, with the ball joint. So with that out of the way, let's move to the back. I can show you some stuff back there. Now we're in the uh, back section. As you can see, uh, there is space back here for a differential and axles and stuff like that. So if you have an all wheel drive, basically the only difference that you're going to notice is a differential, a Haldex unit and uh, some axles coming out here. Otherwise, everything is going to be more or less the same. Starting out, here's the uh, trailing arm and it actually has the hub assembly bolted onto it. And this is one of the main focus points on the P3 chassis is if you follow this to the front, basically you're going to see a large bushing attaching this trailing arm to the chassis. That is very common to fail um, at around 60 to 80,000 miles. When it fails, the bushing will completely separate from the outer ring and you'll end up getting movement back and forth in this, which will in turn cause a vibration in the back. It also cause a lot of wandering on the highway, especially in high winds, which is not to say that's not normal with other rear suspension components when they fail to have a kind of a wandering feel in the rear end but that is generally the prime culprit is this bushing right here. 
So moving back from the trailing arm bushing, this is going to be the main mounting area where all of the suspension components attach to. So this would be your uh, lower link. Uh, it's got two bushings right here. Here's your forward toe link. When this goes bad, basically you'll have really bad tire wear uh, because the toe of the tire will be able to shift and move around. At the top, you have an upper link to balance out the bottom link. Both of these two control arms will cause negative or positive camber problems. If you have a lot of negative camber in the back, you'll definitely want to check this upper link to make sure that one of these bushings aren't crushed. The rear springs on these are more robust than the P2 chassis. I have not seen any uh, breakages. That's not to say that it can't happen. So make sure that if you're back here, take a look at the spring, make sure you know the paint or anything is flaking off because anything that's made of metal is susceptible to rust and failure. Moving to the rear shock, very basic rear shock. Fortunately for the P3 chassis, the rear shock is mounted on the outside of the actual chassis itself, so it's very easy to change. There are three shocks available for the P3 chassis. This is just the very basic one. As you can see, it's just a standard tube shock. Also available is a Nevomat shock, which is a much fatter looking shock. It's basically a self-leveling shock absorber and it has a spring inside. So if you were to have Nevomats on the back, when you load the rear up, it will eventually level out and, and be the correct uh, ride height. When those go bad, because they have an internal spring, usually that internal spring breaks as the failure mode and you'll have one side kind of like sagging. So if you have Nevo mats and you have a sagging rear end, definitely check out that rear uh, shock and make sure that that's not blown. And there's a, the third to go with uh, what I was saying with the front is that if you have a 4C active electronic shock absorber setup, then you will also see the rear shock will have an electronic uh, portion on it. And if you have the 4C shocks, then you have to replace that with 4C shocks. So this V60 has the standard basic shock absorber. It is a sport chassis, but it's just a, it's a non-electronic, non-Nevo mat. So if you have a standard shock, you gotta replace it with a standard shock. If you've got a Nevo mat, replace it with a Nevo mat. And if you have a 4C active electronic shock, you have to replace it with a 4C active electronic shock. So like the front, the rear also has a subframe that all the uh, suspension pieces basically attach to to bolt onto the chassis. And because of that, it's also got subframe bushings. Unlike the front, the rear, especially on front wheel drive cars, does not get that much work, it kind of just gets dragged around. So the bushings are much less likely to go bad, but to tell if they're bad, you basically can just put a pry bar in and give it a little bit of a prying action. This is very uh, tight, fortunately. With all of the links and control arms that I mentioned, basically the best way to tell if they're bad is to just use your handy pry bar, and just kind of go up in there and leverage them all around back and forth. If they're bad, you can see a lot of play. All of these look okay. This is about what they should look like. There's not a lot of play in any of these. If you have a decent amount of play, that can be a major problem when it comes down to safety and stability on the road. When you're back here, you can see the sway bar basically connecting both of the rear wheels and limiting the, uh, the action, the to and fro action of basically the roll of the car. Because these are rubber bushings, of course that means that they're always prone to failure, especially with age. To test those, you can just lever against them. This, these look like they're in pretty good shape. If you have excess play, these are some of the easiest sway bar bushings to replace. You, they, you can see the bracket, they just come right out. Up here, directly behind the brake caliper, you'll see the sway bar end link. At the top, the design is two bushings, and then at the bottom is a ball joint. If you have a clunk in the rear end, uh, definitely check that out. These can also squeak if they go bad because the bushings will start to get loose and every single time you go over a bump, it'll start squeaking. Another thing that can cause a squeak is also that front trailing arm bushing. So if you've got a squeak, look at your rear sway bar end links and look at that trailing arm bushing in the front there. All right. As you can see, the Volvo P3 is definitely an evolution of the P1, and that chassis carried over a lot of things from the P2 chassis. Thank you for watching. If this video was helpful, leave a like and let us know. Also, you can hit the comment section below if you have any questions or comments. Maybe you own a P3 chassis and we maybe missed something. And we have a lot of Volvo content coming down uh, the pipeline, so definitely subscribe to us, and I'll catch you next time.